Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Flint service. My name is David Clement, and I will be your worship associate this morning. Really grateful that everyone can be here this morning together. Uh, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Flint isn't just a building. We're a fellowship of like-minded people following our own paths towards truth and self-discovery while supporting each other along the way. We're bound not by a creed of required beliefs, but by a set of principles, which can be found on our website. We're a welcoming faith and invite people regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity. Some announcements for this morning. This is a double your gift opportunity. It is second Sunday for our donation in August, and it will go to the Food Bank of Eastern Michigan Backpack Food Program at Eisenhower Elementary School. Our donations in the past have ranged from $875 to $1,400 in the last four years. <clears throat> Each $400 provides a weekend of food for qualified child for a full school year. This month, SCAF Furniture Carpet One will match every dollar up to $10,000. Imagine $3 keeps a child fed over the weekend. Thank you for considering this. Also, a new adult education class started last week and will continue for the next two months. It's not too late to sign up. It's entitled, What Moves Us? And it's about learning to enjoy and celebrate who you use are in the world. If you're interested, please call or email Lynn to sign up. The class meets Wednesdays at six o'clock. Now, will you please join us in beginning our service, listening to a prelude from Jennifer Howard. This morning's chalice lighting reading is by Betty Doherty. 
Glory be. Glory be to the earth and the wind. Glory be to the sun and the rain. Glory be to animals and children. Glory be to our holy name, which calls us together as one. For this morning's covenant, you can follow along with me if you know it or if you have it at home. Recognizing the richness of diversity, the beauty and wonder of shared worship, and the transforming power of love and service, we gather as a sacred, intentional community to freely seek knowledge and truth, to celebrate the fullness of life, and by our actions, to increase goodness and justice. Our opening words this morning come from Maya Angelou. We need the courage to create ourselves daily, to be bodacious enough to create ourselves daily. As Christians, as Jews, as Muslims, as thinking, caring, laughing, loving human beings, I think that the courage to confront evil and to turn it by dint of will into something applicable to the development of our evolution individually and collectively is exciting. It is honorable. Please join in a spirit of meditation from women's rights activist Rose Schneiderman, written in 1911. Every time the workers come out in the only way they know to protest against conditions which are unbearable, the strong hand of the law is allowed to press down heavily upon us. Public officials have only words of warning to us, warning that we must be intensely peaceable. The strong hand of the law beats us back when we rise into the conditions that make life unbearable. What the woman who labors wants is the right to live, not simply exist. The right to life as the rich woman has the right to life and the sun and music and art. You have nothing that the humblest worker has not a right to also. The worker must have bread, but she must have roses too.
100 years hence, what a change will be made in politics, morals, religion, and trade. In statesmen who wrangle or ride on the fence, these things will be altered 100 years hence. Then woman, man's partner, man's equal shall stand while beauty and harmony govern the land to think for oneself will be no offense. The world will be thinking 100 years hence. This poem was written 168 years ago by Francis Dana Barker Gage, a poet and universalist. Gage was also an abolitionist and an early women's rights activist. In later years, she was often in the company of high profile suffragists, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Their names are familiar and rightly so. They fought, as we heard in the meditation, for a woman's right to live a rich life, not simply to exist. It was a battle to get the 19th Amendment adopted to the Constitution on August 26th of 1920, almost exactly 100 years ago. Less for the few states that took the lead before that. But we seldom hear about the thousands of women and men, white and black, wealthy and poor, in the West, East, South and Midwest, that wrote and spoke and rode and marched, that were jailed and mistreated, who also fought that hard battle. At 100 years, I think it's cause for celebration of the suffragists whose names are rarely mentioned. Yes, even if all we know about the suffragists is their names, Let's celebrate them, even if their work is not complete. Think of it. The suffragist movement was the largest mobilization of women our country had ever witnessed. What better way to comm commemorate those unsung heroes than to hear a few of their stories? And there's no so shortage. Nearly 1,000 women went to jails with appalling conditions and were treated barbarically. Women on hunger strikes were force-fed. Black suffragists experienced racism from their sisters who worked for the exact same cause. Some women who toiled for their rights suffered abuse by their husbands or lost their families. Partners became single parents. Female factory workers stood up for the first time to their bosses. And women started filing lawsuits for the first time in this country. Countless women wrote or performed music and dances and pageants to get the attention of the nation. And then charismatic speakers brought the message home. The names and the faces are endless. So I chose just a few to acknowledge today. Now, most people see Seneca Falls Convention in 1848 as the real beginning of the suffrage movement in America. Now, there were other gatherings, but Seneca Falls galvanized the 300 women that attended into a movement. There, they concluded that two of the most difficult barriers were these. First, how does one demand the right to vote when they can't vote on the right to vote? And secondly, can the political culture of men be changed? Now, on the first question, the goal was to convince both women and men in America with rational arguments 
that women deserved the vote as human beings. The second question was more nuanced. Polling was different then. Voting took place in warehouses and livery stables and saloons. And men talked, drank, argued, and even fought during polling. It was doubtful that a respectable woman would be convinced to vote in such a place. Suffragists would need to learn and civilize the political discourse and move it into the public arena. Thus began decades of marches and meetings, conventions and correspondence, protests and publications, arrests and articles, parades, and pageants. And here are a few women that help make it all happen. Whatever pertains to the honor and prosperity of this country, and especially the great question of human rights, is certainly in some sense women's matter as much as man's said Universalist Mary Newberry Adams in one of her many speeches. Now Mary Newberry was just 11 years old when the Seneca Falls Convention occurred. But her father, a Presbyterian minister and educator, was already giving her the education that she would need to become a suffragist. Mary's father, was run out of towns by his congregations in Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio due to his desire to establish colleges or acad acad academy, ac academies that either provided women with an education or became co-ed. These ideas were not welcomed in the smaller towns of his pastorates. Without nearby schools in the towns that they lived, the Newberry children were educated at home. The children were taught by both parents. The walls of their homes were covered with maps and poetries and illustrated pictures of important places. And the children were constantly either being read to or reading books. And they also heard oral histories of the eight generations of their grandmothers that had settled in America. Perhaps that's one reason Mary respected strong women. The other reason would be she watched her mother. Mrs. Newberry would take care of things while Mr. Newberry was out in the country preaching. Even once, Mrs. Newberry chased away a mob of men who had attacked their home in search of a fugitive slave. That day, Mrs. Newberry told her frightened children, do not fear, for we are in the right. As the Newberry children and family were on the Underground Railroad, the fugitive was indeed there and in a cistern on their property for expressly that purpose, but the fugitive was never found by those attackers. In 1856, Mary attended a female seminary in Iowa, and it was there that she noticed how differently men and women were treated at their respective colleges. After graduation, she married Austin Adams, a lawyer and teacher who also firmly believed in women's equality. She wrote to her sister after having her first child, since Annabelle's birth, I feel a great desire to gain knowledge and truth on all subjects, not only for my own improvement, but that I may guide and direct her future studies and perhaps prevent her from being oppressed with prejudices and superstitions. Mary felt that advancing her education was just an extension of being a good mother. Mary continued her education 
But she did not become totally committed to the suffrage movement until 1869, when she was covering an event for a newspaper and she heard Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Sp Canton speak. Now by the 1870s, she was corresponding with Bronson Alcott and Ralph Waldo Emerson, and she even invited them to her Iowa home. Emerson called her the most inspiring woman he'd ever met. Later, she visited Concord, Massachusetts, and her accommodating husband said to her, cultivate the friendship of men. Mary formed a woman's club that discussed everything from art to science to equality. These groups had been forming all across the country and soon they were becoming nationalized. The first becoming the Association for the Advancement of Women with Mary as one of the 20 of the national vice presidents. By this time, she had become a polished public speaker and sought after across America. When she died in 1901, the minister at the service reminded the mourners of the support Mary had had throughout her entire life, especially when he opened the Bible that Mary's father had given her when she was 11. In the front cover, her father had listed important women throughout the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, and in the book of Esther, he had written, Courage to Open a New Way. While Mary was well-educated and found friendship with great thinkers of her time, other suffragists were looking to simply gain the basic rights of human beings, the right to a life with sun and music and art for women was what Rose Schneiderman strived for. Her family came from Poland and shortly after they settled in New York City in 1890, her father died, leaving the three children with her mother with a child on the way. When Rose's mother could not keep the family going with her odd jobs, the children were temporarily sent to an orphanage. When they were returned to Rose's mother, when she had a steady job, bad luck struck again. Rose lost, Rose's mother lost her job and at 13, Rose was the oldest and was sent to work. She got a job as a sales girl, girl because her mother said that was the only respectable job a girl could have. But factory jobs paid the most money and Rose knew it. And so she arranged to get a job in a cap making factory. Rose soon learned about several things there. First, men got the best paying and most desirable jobs. And she learned that she liked trade unionism, socialism and feminism. She eventually organized a union in her shop and she moved into a national union position quickly and rose in the ranks of the suffrage movement. She became internationally known as a champion of working women's rights and earned the nickname, the Red Rose of Anarchy. At four, at four foot nine, she said in one speech, what does all this talk about becoming mannish signify? I wonder if it will add to my height if I get the vote. Surely women won't lose any more of their beauty and charm by putting a ballot in a ballot box once a year. Then they are likely to lose standing in foundries or laundries all year long. Her best known speech was given in 1911 and was also made into a song. And that was what I read in part at the meditation. Bonnie is going to sing Bread and Roses for you. And I'll come back to you with a few more stories. Bread and Roses by James Oppenheim. As 
as we go marching, marching in the beauty of the day. A million darkened kitchens, a thousand mills gray, are touched with all the radiance that a sudden sun discloses for the people hear us singing bread and roses bread and roses as we go marching marching we battle to for men for they are women's children and we mother our lives shall not be sweated from birth until life closes. Parts starve as well as bodies. Give us bread, but give us roses. As we go marching, marching, unnumbered women dead. Go crying through our singing their ancient call for bread small art and love and beauty their drudging spirits knew yes it is bread we fight for but we fight for roses too as we go marching we bring the greater days. The rising of the women means the rising of the race. No more the drudge and idler tend that toil while one reposes, but a sharing of life's glories, bread and roses, bread and Sisters Maud and Annie Nathan were not lacking bread and roses when they were growing up with their two brothers in an elite uptown neighborhood in New York City. Life was easy until 1875 when their father's business failed and he moved the family to a small town in Wisconsin where there were very few Jewish families. When their father's infidelity became known and their mother had no friends to turn to, she began to abuse drugs. She attempted suicide and was hospitalized. Maud, being the eldest, ushered her siblings onto a train back to New York City to live with their grandparents. A month later, they learned that their mother had died. Their mother's death sparked a rivalry between the two sisters that lasted the rest of their lives. Annie claimed that Maud shut her out while she grieved and stole all the attention from the grandparents. Annie felt neglected and alone. Then Maud left home at 17, married her cousin who was 18 years her senior. Six years later, they had a daughter who died at age nine. In Maud's grief, a friend suggested that Maud keep busy with volunteer work. Maud found her way to the suffragists. Meanwhile, her sister Annie was at Columbia University, even though her father told her that no man would ever marry an educated woman. Annie did marry a doctor who was 13 years older when she was 20. She stopped university, but was soon helping to establish Barnard College and insisted that female students be admitted, and they were, in 1889. Both sisters looked beyond their domestic tasks for fulfillment. Maud said her latent feminism led her to suffrage, while Annie said that she liked working with women who were heart hungry and brain famished. The difference, 
Well, Annie was anti-suffrage, or an anti, as they were called, and, of course, Maud was a suffragist. Large anti-organizations were active across the country at the time. Their rationale was that with women voting, they would cease volunteering in their charitable and educational projects. Antis also thought that politics were just too dirty for proper women. A common saying was, would women really want to sink so low as to associate with politicians? With Annie and Maud at odds, the subject of the vote was taboo at family gatherings for them. Maud found Annie's anti-stance particularly frustrating considering her advanced education and extensive volunteerism for the advancement of women. Maud suspected she was just being contrary because she held a grudge related to their mother's death. It was clear to Maud that Annie wanted to make this a public feud. Annie penned and published over 350 anti-suffragist letters to the editor, plus many articles. Her argument included several points. First, would women really vote as a block, as the suffragists said? And second, why did they have to be anti-male? And why did they have to be so angry? She also accused them of sex antagonism. The press had a lot of fun comparing the two sisters' arguments in the public. Newspapers were calling them the Fighting Nathan Sisters. Now, Maud was a very popular speaker, and her husband, who was also a suffragist, usually accompanied her as she traveled to different venues. And Maud occasionally dressed up like her sister, to make fun of her in her speeches. Maud believed that modern women needed lives outside of domestic concerns. In one speech, she said, I became convinced that legislators would never give consideration to the women's point of view so long as we women had no political status. Maud argued that voting women would make better mothers and wives. When New York State finally gave women the vote, Annie encouraged women to stay home from the polls. In the 1950s, when Annie wrote her autobiography, she admitted that the vote did not produce quite the disastrous consequences she had predicted but neither did they make much of a difference, she said. She claimed she was an anti until the end of her life. Women from more privileged lives may not have thought that voting made that much of a difference to them, but another woman saw enough in one summer to realize that suffrage was crucial to many women. Claiborne Catlin was born in Maryland in 1881. She married her husband when she was very young, but he died just four years later of typhoid. She then packed up and moved to attend the New York School of Philanthropy. It was there that she was introduced to some of the worst living conditions she had ever seen. She decided to do settlement work and work in psychological clinics in various large cities. Eventually, she landed in Boston and she became a suffragist to change the status quo. At the state's suffrage headquarters there, she had been asked to find free advertising for an event with a nationally acclaimed speaker, Anna Shaw. For two weeks, she begged businesses to come up with some free advertising for her, but failed. Nearly collapsing at the headquarters office, finally an idea hit her. Inez Milholland 
a well-known activist, had ridden on a white horse for suffrage and gotten quite a lot of attention. Claiborne thought, I'll try it. Claiborne borrowed a horse, put a placard on each side of it, advertising the event, and rode away on a rainy day. For three days, she rode up and down the streets of Boston as crowds and reporters followed her. Local businesses gave her food and drink for free. And as people passed, she talked about how important the movement was to her. She said, I began to realize that they were listening to me as if I were Anna Shaw herself. The event sold out. With that success, Claiborne wondered, what could I accomplish if I rode a horse all summer across the entire state of Massachusetts? She decided to start with no money and rely completely on the kindness of strangers. The headline in the Boston Herald on June 30th of 1914 read, Woman to Urge Cause in Saddle. Mrs. Catlin, suffragist, will tour state on horseback, starts penniless. She began in Cape Cod to take advantage of the summer crowds, a smart move if you've ever been to the Cape in the summer. Early on, she was lucky to meet a wealthy woman who gave her a good horse and money and a place to sleep as she rode to different cities during the day. Although the woman said she was not in favor of suffrage, she said that Claiborne impressed her with her ideas and said, I do believe in you, little lady. That summer, Claiborne spent her days giving talks, taking up collections, and riding to the next destination across the state. She stayed in people's homes overnight, and often they would put up her horse as well. Only once did she have to sleep outside, and of course that night it rained, and only once did the horse get to eat, and she didn't. One night, she must have looked particularly bad because a supporter had offered her a bed earlier in the day, and then when she turned up to their home at their door in the evening, the person directed her to a local boarding house. Claiborne was a good speaker, but she admitted that some men said they supported her because she was young, pretty, and brave enough to be riding across the state on a horse alone. They called her an adventurous, a sacrificing little thing, and a thrilling girl. She knew not everyone approved of how she garnered her votes, but she was glad to get them. Of course, not all was pleasant that summer. Brass bands would suddenly appear in the town square to drown out her speeches. And once, a car went by pelting her and her horse with apples. Once, a woman rode with her on her horse for an entire day. And once, a man told her to go to a nearby restaurant and order anything she wanted and he'd pay. So more often than not, people were kind. More importantly, Claiborne wanted people to know what she was fighting for. And she found it. She was able to tell stories about how she had met wives who were beaten by their husbands, or how she met families who were destitute, and how she met children who were hungry and had nowhere to go. She battled exhaustion, and a few times she said she even got tired of even thinking the word suffrage. But by mid-September, she got to the Boston Common for a huge rally, and everyone celebrated her return. In the end, she had organized 59 meetings in 79 days with an average attendance of 200 people. She had covered 530 miles and visited 
37 cities. There are thousands of other stories to tell about the four mothers and even a few forefathers that fought for six decades for women's right to vote. I celebrate them and I thank them for our bread and roses. But the struggle continues for justice, equity, and compassion for all. Let's hope it is within our grasp at least a hundred years hence or before. May it be so. Our closing words are from Julia Butterfly Hill. May we love evermore. May we motivate ourselves to committed love in action. May we motivate ourselves to live the life we wish to see in the world. May we be the transformation we wish to see in the world. From the inside out, from the roots branching upwards, from the heart to thought to word to action, through life's trials and hardships, we can arise beautiful and free. Let us go in peace. And let us extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you.